Ms. Nelson is the president of Sensei Enterprise, a digital forensic information technology and information security firm in Fairfax, Virginia. Ms. Nelson graduated from Georgetown University Law Center and has been in private practice ever since, now concentrating exclusively in electronic evidence law. Ms. Nelson was the president of the Virginia State Bar June 2013 through June 2014, and is the past president of the Fairfax Law Foundation and a past president of the Fairfax Fire Association. I'm tired of it. Mr. Simic is the vice president of Cincinnati Enterprises. He has a national reputation as a digital forensic <coughs> technologist and has testified as an expert witness throughout the United States. He holds a degree in engineering from the United States Merchant Marine Academy and an MBA in finance from St. Joseph's University. He holds a prestigious certified information system security professional and NK certified examiner certification. Yeah, our bios go on forever. We actually have a short form bio, which obviously they didn't send you. They did not. Well, next time you'll know to ask. They are highly qualified to give this presentation today. Please get a warm welcome. Thank you. And I'm sorry for those of you who are in DC that you cannot see the screen. Look at that. Will you allow? I guess oh, yes. Yes. Sorry. Somebody has Thank you. Okay. All right. So <laughs> we, we whoa. It's sharing. It takes a second to come okay. right. Takes a second to share and to care. Well, it'll shift with the color just Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you, your questions are welcome at any time, so feel free to ask away. Um, this presentation has been updated over the course of the last two weeks. It's extraordinarily current, so even if you've seen some version of it. Right until this morning. Uh, right until this morning when we drove our host crazy by saying we've made more updates, here's the new version. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, the cover that you saw there was the ABA Journal, and uh, Dewey LeBeuf is the firm uh, in New York that went under, and the roses they put on their faces because they, the lawyers had painted such a rosy picture of the finances of the firm, uh, and as you will learn later when we talk about the case, the rosiness was really nothing that was real. Uh, the jury has that case now, and they have not come back as of this morning. Well, woman with Shut up, I have to figure it out. <laughs> because the error doesn't show. Um, this was the, we're married, which is what that, that looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, presenters don't talk like that. But this is, they call us a My maintenance, right, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> they call us a Rob and John and Sherry show. So okay. Well, thank you. No commercial no commercial yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So there you go. Okay, this was the title of an article I saw recently. Love I lawyers are ethical violations waiting to happen. And, and I certainly think that's true. You got a little flavor of that listening to Christy when she was talking about you really have to understand the implications of social media. You just can't wander off and do whatever you want. So <clears throat> this is Rule 1.1 and 1.6. Rule 1.1, they changed the comment at the ABA level and said, a lawyer should keep aggressive changes in the law and its practice, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. Um, that, that has now been adopted in 14 states. Has it been adopted in Virginia? Not yet. Uh, in June, the Virginia State Bar Council passed the, uh, not entirely the whole thing, but most of it, um, and, and I'll tell you what they didn't pass because it's funny. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. So <laughs> we've done it. We sent it to the Supreme Court back in June. I know they met in August, but we have not heard back from the Supreme Court whether they are going to adopt that version or whether they have any questions they want to ask us. These are the 14 states that have adopted Comment H Rule 1.1. I thank my friend John Trenetic from Catalyst who allowed me to use his chart here that shows you the 14 states. So we might, we might be on this map almost any day, but we're not there yet. <clears throat> Mod, the, now, Model Rule 1.6, they changed the, the rule itself, saying that a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the unintended disclosure of or unauthorized access, access to information relating to the representation of a client. Clearly the problem there is the word reasonable efforts. What does that mean? 
It involves the sensitivity of the information as, a, for instance, you are never ever going to see the formula for Coca-Cola transmitted over email. That is just simply not going to happen. Um, one of the factors is the likelihood that it will be disclosed if there are not additional safeguards. So important information, you might need more safeguards. The cost of employing the safeguards. So the big firms are going to be held to a standard way up here. Venable is going to be held to a very high standard. The, the solos and the smalls, the costs in some cases are, are, what, are much too much for them. Or it's perhaps the difficulty of implementing the safeguards, although the safeguards have gotten infinitely easier and less costly over time. And does it have any adverse effect on the lawyer's ability to represent the client? What I mean by that is, suppose you want to put security software over here, but it doesn't get along with case management software over there. So if you've got some kind of issue like that, that would be another factor as well. Now, a client may require more security. That's the ABA version. We took this out in Virginia. Um, Probably those of us who were sitting the officers, I was then the immediate past president, and Kevin Martingale, then the president, he whispered to me, these guys don't want this. What's wrong with them? You want to talk to them? And I said, Kevin, if the client demands more and they won't give it, the client's going to walk out the door. I said, it doesn't matter. So I didn't fight it. Um, but that's what the council did. They said that the client may not require more. That language is gone. But they will walk. And the reason we find law firms you know, just ramping up in security is because clients are demanding it. And clients are saying, you've got to pass this security audit. And they don't even understand the questions on the audit. That's a problem. So we are finding client demand, client demand for encryption. That's driving the law firms. They don't have a choice. If they want the business, they've got to do it. Um, now, it doesn't address any legal or regulatory duties, so that's all outside of this. And when transmitting a communication that includes information relating to the representation of a client, the lawyer must take reasonable precautions to prevent the information from coming into the hands of unintended recipients. These days, that often means that email, which no one believes is private anymore, um, email must be encrypted in reasonable circumstances, appropriate circumstances. California has become the first state to require confidence in e-discovery. That really was quite a firestorm on the legal blogs. They did this just in June of this year, and they said, look, if you, if you can't learn it, if you're not confident, then you need to acquire the skills that are needed. You need to find. Yeah, this is the new one, thank you. Because <laughs> I see my, my misspelling has been corrected. Uh, you need to find some skilled lawyer or expert assistance, or you have to decline the representation. Now that's pretty stark. You've got to decline it if you don't do one of those things. And lack of confidence may lead to a violation of Rule 1.6. So, very interesting. So, the, I'm not going to read this screen, but you're going to hear stories. The stories of the bad boys and bad girls of law are wonderful. That's what everybody comes for. And I guarantee you, you will go home tonight and you will be telling stories because you're not going to believe what the speakers told us today in our ethics session because some of the stories are great. Now, that we have to go through all the ethics slides first because that's part of the None of the real. stories are made up. Now, you could you make them up. You absolutely couldn't make them up. Um, can, can, do you guys see us now? Yes? Okay. All right. We're back on track. Just wanted to make sure you could see. So the list of our misdeeds is very, very long, <laughs> and we have actually come into some of this. We have had lawyers come to Sensei, which does digital forensics, cybersecurity, and information technology, and we've had lawyers come in, and they've been very candid about the fact that they're shopping for experts, and they want to find an expert that they can spin. Now, is that ethical? Of course it's not. And so I politely show them where the door is and explain that they have come to the wrong location. Um, but that's something that lawyers routinely do, is look for experts that they can spin. So what should you guys be doing, right? Exactly what you're doing now. Get educated in CLEs, because this stuff is changing rapidly, right? We've seen more changes in the law in the last decade than we have in the last couple hundred years. So make sure that you are maintain your confidence, um, that your uh, assistants are, that you're, and if not, as Sharon said, get some, get some help. Know what you don't know and when you're outside of your league. So, our first story. 
This goes. This is August of this year in Queens. You'll see there. This is a. This is an actual uh, tour bus. Was swerving to miss the car, smashed into this law firm. Small law firm. Nobody was hurt. Nobody was there. The problem, however, though, are you ethically required to uh, make sure, certainly, that your data is safe? What if they got nothing but a bunch of paper stuff? So now we got a fire in there, boom, stuff's gone. Or electronic, do they have off-site backup here? <clears throat> but these are the kinds of things that you need to think about. So if you get into the catastrophe like this, you're ethically required to properly represent your client. So if you don't have a backup off-site, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to miss a court deadline? How are you going to deal with all that stuff? Cyber insurance is good risk management, but they don't cover stupid. And this was a real case for recently in July. It didn't involve a law firm, but boy, it made all the legal blogs and everybody was talking about it. Most people don't know whether they have cyber insurance. Most people don't know whether their firm does, and most people don't know what it covers. So you see, I love Albert Einstein's quote there. Two things that are infinite. The universe, infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not so sure about the universe. Well, when I read this case, I went, you know, that's just the perfect quote. What happened here, and it was reported in July of this year, Cottage Health System had a breach uh, in 2013, and they said, oh, but that's okay, we're insured. But they refused, the insurer refused to pay because the, the uh, policy required minimum required practices, and they said they hadn't done it. Now, John's going to tell you what they didn't do, but I just want to point out as a Star Trek fan, that's a double face palm. So that's when one face palm isn't enough. You've got to plant your hand. There you go. So these are some of the things that they didn't do. They didn't properly, properly configure their IT systems. They didn't have proper uh, regular patch management. In other words, they weren't installing updates, right? That's what is a reason why vendors release updates, so that you can apply them and then make your system secure because the vulnerability's been discovered. They didn't do that. Uh, they, had, uh, f f they frequently didn't uh, analyze their systems, whether what their risk factors are, are they subject to attack, et cetera, any of those kinds of things. When they were breached, their data was exposed on the internet for about two months is what they, what they figured. Uh, their, the data was in clear text. It wasn't encrypted. They had no systems in place to identify or monitor or even log the, uh, the attempts to access the data that's there. Since the data was in clear text, and we've actually had a, another real case <laughs> where the you could just Google it. So the Google robots are climbing all around the internet, the internet as you know it, indexing all this data. So if it's in clear text and it's not encrypted, you just do a search, it's exposed. Boom, pops right up there. So that's why they didn't cover stupid. <laughs> and, and a lot of law firms took note of that and started saying, what are the minimum required uh, practices under our insurance policy, which nobody really reads. They have a cybersecurity rider, and nobody understands the rider. Or these days, it could be integrated in policy. They don't understand that either. So somebody at everybody's law firm better be looking at that. A, another non-law firm case, but an amazing one, which is going to impact law firms, just happened in August with Wyndham Hotel Group, they had three breaches, three breaches, and the FTC said enough. They said that they had the power to bring enforcement actions against businesses that failed to take reasonable steps to prevent breaches, and they have filed more than 50 actions so far. Do we have law firms that have been breached multiple times? Heck yes. Could they come after them? Heck yes. So that is something that is also worrying law firms. Kia Motors, which as you see the tagline, they have the power to surprise. Well, they surprised some of their lawyers and some people who wanted to be their lawyers. They audited uh, nine firms and their associates, and all nine failed in the audit. Now, some of, some of the firms were simply not hired, but those who stayed working for Kia, they had to agree to a 5% price reduction until they could pass the audit, which was an audit of legal technology skills. So what couldn't they do? They couldn't do the basic functions of Word and Excel. That's pretty amazing to me. I mean, going to law school, they don't teach anything about this, um, and apparently not. They, they, they would, to print the PDF, they would print out the document, and then they would take it to the scanner. You know, the print the PDF button is so much easier, right? 
Um, Excel sort and filter. I can through the metadata that way. Yeah, yeah. Excel sort and filter. It should have taken them 20 minutes to generate from a spreadsheet list uh, a list of exhibits associated with witnesses on specific topics. It took five and a half hours on average. Now, you, you just figured the billing rates there, and that is unconscionable that they don't have these basic skills. And they, they, were, they were brute forcing PDF by PDF by PDF because they didn't know how to batch search. Now, that's crazy. It's just insane. I, what are they teaching in law school? That's the first thing that Casey Flaherty from Kia asked, and others as well have asked the same question. And what, one of the answers was, was given by a law student who said, well, you know, if they had Facebook and Instagram as courses in law school, I would have gotten an A, and my parents would have been so proud. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, that's sad, but there's probably some close to The scary part about this whole thing that Casey Flaherty did was these were senior associates he tested. Yeah, senior associates. Not the not junior the associates. And, and not he, the partners. And you know what? <laughs> he, did, he didn't test the partners because he didn't want to humiliate them. <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting way of answering it. Now, this is our friend, who is now Dean Andy Perlman. He was a professor. He just became Dean at Suffolk University School of Law. You can see by the Google Glass that he's kind of a geeky guy. He is brilliant. Um, he actually has his students text him questions which appear in Google Glass, and then he answers them. So we liked Andy instantly when we met him, which is a line from Shawshank Redemption, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did question Andy on the wisdom of giving his students his cell phone number. <laughs> yes, he certainly did. Yeah. Well, Andy hooked up with Casey Flaherty from Kia, and what they have done is automated the audit, which is online, and it is the Suffolk Flaherty Legal Tech Audit, and you can go on and you can find more about it. We are telling folks that this is a real differentiator if you can say you passed this audit and you're looking for a job. Um, but what, it, what it's being used for primarily right now is it's being used by general counsels and corporations. You know, they have that less for, uh, more for less is their value proposition now. So they're testing to make sure they're getting value for their dollars. So they are insisting that the people who work on their cases be able to pass this audit and that they get proof of it. Pretty interesting stuff. So let's move into Bitcoins. Everybody know what Bitcoins are, right? Anybody traded Bitcoins? We have one brave soul. <laughs> hey, do you know the difference between the Bitcoin network and the physical currency? How you tell? The, net, the network is, uses a capital B. That's the infrastructure of the Bitcoin network. The lowercase b is the actual currency itself. So what is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is cryptocurrency. <coughs> It's electronic, it's worldwide, it's distributed on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Every single node on that network knows about Bitcoins. And there's, it's the ledger, uh, so they know that if there's a transfer at one point, then the ledger gets updated. So all these transactions run around there. Uh, it's based upon the demand. The value is based upon supply and demand of, of Bitcoins. That are, that are there it was first started in 2008 and then became open source software in 2009. So it's still relatively young. It's one, and there's several other uh, cryptocurrencies that are out there, virtual currencies they call them as well, but it's, uh, it's probably the most popular uh, of, of them all. Today, Bitcoin is, one Bitcoin is worth $236 US. Uh, back in November of uh, 2014, it was 427. In January of uh, this year, it was down to 177. So you can already see how volatile the Bitcoin movement is. And that's that's one reason why the ethics of this is that if a law firm decides to accept Bitcoin, the ethics is that you should probably convert it instantly to real money. We'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, it's primarily used by criminals, bad guys, or criminal defense attorneys because that's their clients are the criminals. And they want to trade in Bitcoins. That's primarily where we, where we see that. Or if you're trying to hide money from your spouse, you know, as well. We see it in family law. Family law, we see that, yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry. I'm asking. She knows again. Yes. So the lawyers accept Bitcoins. Well, yeah, more and more are accepting it. Uh, the, back in February, there's a law firm in Virginia who was thought to be the first one in Virginia to accept Bitcoins. Uh, they're an estate planning firm. Uh, they use a, a service called Coinbase that's based out of California. What Bitcoin, what you need to do is Bitcoins are held in an electronic wallet, an encrypted electronic wallet. 
So they don't do you any good unless you can actually convert them into something else or trade, almost like in a barter system, trade a Bitcoin to somebody else for some service, service or product, right? Um, on, the, on the dark web, that's how a lot of the illegal uh, drugs and those kinds of things and child pornography purchases, unfortunately, they trade Bitcoins, they'll transfer a Bitcoin, a certain amount into the person's wallet, electronic wallet, and then they get shipped uh, or sent the, the contraband. Coinbase is an actual financial institution that does the translation of Bitcoin to dollars or Bitcoin to whatever currency. So there are services that are out there that will do, do this kind of thing, uh, this, this um, transition that, that's there. There's more and more now lawyers that are actually accepting Bitcoins that are there. This particular law firm is considering, they haven't had a client yet that, that's actually attempted to pay in Bitcoin, but uh, they're considering keeping some of the money transferred into Bitcoin as, as really almost like a financial hedge, if you will. So if depending on what the Bitcoin is, like day trading, right? So depending on what the market's looking like, they're thinking of savings Put keeping some there. Mr. McCauley and Bar Council is not going to think that's a good idea because in the United States, Bitcoin is property. So you want to convert that property to a value that's recognizable right away. And so he's not going to like that idea. Well, he can go talk to the partner. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, the other reason that folks are liking Bitcoins is there's no financial transaction amount that that's goes along with it, unlike a credit card fee or processing fee or those kinds of things. So there isn't any fee, if you will, that to deal with these Bitcoin transactions. You have questions? I was going to ask that the detainers and dollars are the fee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, no, yeah, they have to do it. Yeah. Uh, and they agree yeah. the fee, and then they hope what the Bitcoin will be? Or is it, are they well, if, if you've got a whole to them. The, the criminal defense attorneys that we're aware of that do currently accept Bitcoins from their clients, they can burn them immediately. So in other words, they, tell, they, they, they tell you, yes, yes, yes. yes. they say, yeah. okay, your retainer is $5,000, that's the, today that's the equivalent of X amount of Bitcoins. So that's what you owe. Yeah. And it's an immediate transfer, and you, you, you accounted for it in an yeah, appropriate yeah. way. Uh, that's actually the, the, the Sheridan in, in England is a uh, entertainment law firm. I just thought that was an interesting photo that they chose to have on their homepage, and they also <laughs> said Bitcoin. Uh, but we still find it mostly in criminal law. Right. Now, can, can a law firm's private investigator, use hackers for hire. What's your best guess? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a crime to hire somebody uh, in order to do that. To do something illegal? <laughs> but this is from March of this year, and there was a PI in New York who pled guilty to stealing email credentials using hackers for hire. Um, the, the, the crime is conspiracy to commit computer hacking, and he said he was working for 20 law firms at the time. 20 law firms is a whole lot of people doing something they shouldn't ought to do. And this shows you the amount of money he had to pay per account hacked, 50 to $250. He was sentenced to 90 days and three years probation, $1,000 fine, and they are now looking for the law firms, the ethics people. So that's not going to go well for them if they find them. So these are the real life stories of the lawyers who had to say, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> the bad girls and boys of law. So the first one comes out of Connecticut. It's Christian Shelton. Uh, and you'll see here that they, the uh, discipline board found him to uh, have put there was probable cause. He was preparing a sham contract. And these are the, the bottom two bullets here are the two ethics uh, violations that they found him in violation of. Basically what he did was an ex-governor um, they thought it would be a great idea if he worked on this re-election campaign of somebody else, uh, just because of what he knew, his contacts, and all that kind of stuff. But if the ex-governor was on the election campaign, he would be doing so unethically. So they couldn't hire him. So Mr. Sheridan thought, well, that's okay. Um, I'll hire him. And then they pay me, and then he doesn't work. Uh, so this whole thing on there, his defense was that he didn't know that it was illicit for the sex governor to be able to work on this. But it all came to light when, because with elections, you have to disclose where your money's going, where it's coming in, where it's going out. Do you notice it says alleged? Alleged. We'll tell, yeah. you, we'll tell you when they actually have been 
discipline. Um, so th this is one who was, Yarborough Sully, I may not be pronouncing her name right, she was suspended for a year beginning in July. That was affirmed by the Supreme Court in August. She charged a client for watching crime shows on television. In fact, she charged the client over $5,000, and in the first three months of her representation, she charged $140,000. Now, they looked at what she had done. She had filed, she had filed the suit, a wrongful death suit, and she had gathered a few records, and for that, she charged $140,000. She blew right through her entire original estimate. She was completely unrepentant. She said, um, what did she say? Since when is watching television uh, not reasonable for legal research? Isn't that how the court went on? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of orders? Same way. Just like CSI is right. So, you know, don't, don't, and in her case, she not only charged for watching all these episodes of 48 hours, she charged for watching them again. <laughs> that's, that's false. <laughs> that's false. Not sense, but false. Okay, so this, this is Dennis Milinchek, who got one year probation in anger management. Um, he originally agreed to a di di uh, disposition, but in September 1st, the story came out that he was asking it to be set aside. So he's using email. You notice all of this is digital stuff that we didn't, we, we could get in trouble, and you won't find us using cases here that's old fashioned trouble. This is the trouble that has to do with the digital error. So he called the client a chief so and so, and you can see all the asterisks and figure out the word, um, and threat to sue. And later he said, okay, drug dealer, I look forward to the many nights and mornings when you think of me, think of my name, and squeal. You mean nothing to me. Check out the movie Deliverance. Now that's just not a smart email. <laughs> it's a great so, movie, though. <laughs> and everybody knows, if they've seen the movie, they know exactly what he's referencing. So. This, this was not smart, but he is, in fact, uh, asking to be set aside. Uh, this is Michael Jerome Moore. This is not Michael Jerome Moore. This is, this is a stock. <laughs> but my, my, I couldn't find a picture of him. I looked. I try all the time. Um, he is a Chicago attorney, um, and there was a complaint filed in August of 2015. So this is not, this is not settled yet. He apparently left abusive voicemails. All black people are alike. You're slovenly, ignorant. Low class, the N word, he's a charming man. I'm going to have you all locked up. And to a different person entirely, he called him a stupid Jew, when you can see what. Um, so the complaint understandably alleges offensive conduct, neglect of criminal appeal, and failure to comply with document requests. The offensive conduct is what I've got here. He called the, he told the press that the whole investigation was ridiculousness. Probably not a good legal word choice either, um, but that's what he said. And <laughs> God bless, I don't know, I don't know. He's obviously got a problem. Yep. We have cyberbullying prosecutors as well, right? So it happens on both sides, whether it's the defense side or the prosecutor side here. And this is from August of this year. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the, the lower court's decision. These are five police officers out of uh, New Orleans, um, where five police officers are, in uh, are gonna get a new trial. Because what happened here is that three of the government lawyers started posting anonymous comments about these police officers. Um, and that, and the other problem that they had was that the prosecutors had uh, cooperating defendants that were testifying, and they all lied. So they've got these lying defendants, they got these government attorneys that are posting uh, comments up there trying to sway the jury into all these decisions, and as you can see there, I'm not going to read them all, but you know, it basically deprived these police officers of a fair trial. I'd like to say the Virginia State Bar, you are occasionally going to read Virginia Lawyers Weekly that we um, favor prosecutors and don't, don't go after them in disciplinary matters. You're going to hear that we don't go after criminal defense counsel. Um, garbage. We go after both of them whenever it's warranted. But either, each one will say that about the other side, which is, which is hysterical because there's so many cases on both sides of the line. Um, anyhow, I'm just defending my bar. <laughs> In August 2015, we had a case of egregious attorney misconduct. This was uh, Karen Bolotti, a lawyer for the California Department of Transportation. She got way over the line. She defeated a claim by a motorist against a, the state after a crash on a very complex road interchange. We're not talking a little bit complex. We're talking it made the Guinness Book of World Records as the most complex interchange. 
So it really was, was a problem. Um, the fourth di appellate district reversed on the case because she ignored a string of motions in limine and repeatedly asked questions after the judge and sustained objections to the question. Why the trial judge allowed it, I don't know. He had the patience of Job, <laughs> but the patience of Job when somebody is not is, is not supposed to be doing it. It's California. It is California. Yes. I know. I once, I, once, wacko, wacko. I once quoted a California case in an argument, and the judge said, California, what else you got? So <laughs> I, I learned, not the Virginia court. Okay, so do you know Godwin's Law? Anybody here know it? Oh, then you're going to, I've been around a little longer than you guys, so I'm going <laughs> to teach you something today. Godwin's Law says, the first side in an argument to compare the other side to Hitler or the Nazis loses. Uh, you can look this up at Wikipedia, which is important. You're not going to cite Wikipedia. It's everywhere else. You know. Come on. You will actually find it in legal cases. Uh, but Bilotti violated the law um, a, a, just a ton of times, just gratuitously saying things about him being a Nazi. And, and you know, he, he, had, he wore a helmet that looks like what they used to call it. See, you wouldn't know any of this. But in World War II, they used to call it a Fritz helmet because it looked like a World War II German soldiers held it. Was that one spike on? No, this was World War I. Yeah, that was World War I. Um, so she kept, kept referring to this kind of stuff over and over and over again. It was absolutely absurd. So the judge, um, Sua Sponte, referred the matter to the California State Bar. Now, uh, if you're wondering if judges refer uh, complaints to the Virginia State Bar, uh, yeah, all the time. All the time we get, the judges will turn lawyers in. So. Remember who has the power when you're in that courtroom. And if the judge tells you to sit down, it's a real good idea to sit down. And if the judge doesn't like your question and, and yeah, sustains an objection, don't ask the question again. I mean, judges hold the power. Um, so, there we go. This one from Nevada, just August of this, this year as well. Uh, this is really, really a sad case. This attorney was uh, faking the the records that clients had completed court order counseling community service in 91 cases. Now, once he got found out, and here's where the really sad part is, um, he actually considered killing himself, sat in the closet with a gun, a loaded gun, and thought, how should I get out of this? His wife actually attempted suicide uh, when, he, when he did all this. He's been <coughs> recommended a five-year suspension. This is a disciplinary panel. The kicker here is, before he can request reinstatement, the panel said he has to retake the bar exam. That's major stuff. This is a, uh, another, another sad case. Louisiana Supreme Court disbarred this, this woman, this attorney. Uh, she went off on a social media blitz. What happened was a friend of hers was uh, having a, a divorce and, and custody issue in Mississippi right next door. Uh, and the judge didn't, uh, didn't rule favorably, I guess, for her friend. And so she thought it was really stupid what the judge did. So she went off on this and created two change.org petitions, uh, started putting blog posts and things up there. Uh, basically, and those are some of the quotes of things that she posted up there, but essentially trying to sway the public because the judges in Mississippi are uh, elected. So that's what she was trying to do. She said basically putting words up there like, don't re reappoint these people, da 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 da, all that. Well, the disciplinary board didn't think that that was a really good idea. <laughs> but you know, a lot of times, if you're before a disciplinary panel, and I hope we were to see any of you there, but the fact that you display a lack of remorse or a defiant attitude, that kills you. Because the moment you say, I'm sorry, I'm going to get help. I have a substance abuse problem. I have depression. Um, I know I need counseling. I'm going to go to lawyer who's helping lawyers. The minute you say, I know I did something unethical and wrong, and I want to fix this, please help me understand how, you're going to get a much more lenient outlook than if you go in there with a defiant attitude and you tell lies and you don't show up. Remember, we had one guy who said he's two hours driving around Richmond and he couldn't find the bar. <laughs> it's pretty hard to drive circles around Richmond for two hours and not be able to find the bar. He just didn't want to come because he didn't want oh, to deal yeah, with the situation. Yeah, he yeah, yeah, yeah. missed the, <laughs> yeah, 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 so he missed his own hearing. Yeah. You know, that's another thing. If you have a hearing and you're named to come to the hearing and you're, you know, you're under process to come to the hearing, show up. Show up, first rule. 
Okay, I've been watching Lee Smolin for a while. He's been in the news for a while. He was this year suspended uh, for one year for faking more than $69,000 in cab expenses. He was suspended by the Illinois Supreme Court and required it required him to have one year of psychiatric treatment. Now, there were an additional $379,000 of expenses questioned, and he paid the, the firm a total of $400,000. What I thought was hysterical was that he moved, when all of this was public, he moved over to DLA, DLA Piper, who knew about all this, and they hired him. All this stuff had been in the press, and they hired him anyway. But he left the DLA Piper when they knew the Supreme Court order was, was coming. The other thing I thought you know, that Lee didn't get too well is when he was asked about why he did this, especially the cab expenses. He said, oh, well, they're, they're all legitimate expenses, but Filling out the real forms with the appropriate information was too hard. It's like robbing a bank until they fill out the forms. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't cost it, it, right? Yeah, uh, it, it, it just didn't make it. Just didn't, didn't, the argument just didn't cut it. Uh, here we have Christopher Hollander, who was suspended by the Indiana Supreme Court for a year. Um, he's a public defender. He texted a <coughs> prostitute. He had, he had found, if I recall, he had found it, an online ad for escort services. And so he dialed the phone number. You know, this is always a mistake. This is always a mistake. And that phone was at the time in police custody. But they said, okay. <laughs> he, a, a, actually, he, he, got, he got the prostitute or, at, at one point, and he offered to help with charges against her and to work with her on the fees. So now he's being set up with a police officer, officer impersonating <coughs> a client, and when, when that police officer, ah, uh, see, I forgot officer, um, tried to hug and kiss, <laughs> yeah, I know this one, <laughs> tried to hug and kiss her, and he indicated that he wanted sex in exchange for legal services. Let me tell you that this never goes well, and we see it a lot. They text this stuff, uh, they do it in person in their setup. Uh, they email. It, it's just Sext. absurd. Sexting. Oh, well, wait, isn't that next? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good segue. <laughs> this is Je Jeffrey Marcalis. He was disbarred by the Maryland Court of Appeals this year. You see what I mean? We we throw out most of the old stories and we try to we try to show you that this happens all the time everywhere. He sexted an unrepresented opposing party, offered to find a sugar daddy who would pay to watch her perform sexual acts. Um, the court, unsurprisingly, found this prejudicial to the administration of justice, and they looked back at his history. He already had one suspension for sexing, and then he had another suspension for trading a painkiller for oral sex. So, you know, this guy was establishing quite a record with the disciplinary folks in Maryland. So he can think about that for a while, well, for a long time since he's been disbarred. So let's, let's move up, up the coast a little bit, up to New York. With Bronx, Bronx Defenders is a legal aid group up in New York. They actually have a, a contract with New York City to represent the indigent clients and those types of things and in family matters. Uh, that contract is worth $20 million. So these two attorneys that are named up there end up resigning. Uh, they appeared in a rap video. Now what happened here is that the girlfriend of the video producer also was one of the Bronx Defenders and asked these two attorneys to participate in this video shoot. <clears throat> so they went through all this stuff, uh, and they had the, the attorney's uh, response was that they, they thought that they would have an opportunity to edit the, the, the script and, and those kinds of things, but the, uh, what ended up happening was the lyrics were very offensive. It actually encouraged uh, violence uh, against the police, and so under pressure, they ended up just out of, out of the whole thing. Uh, this is a prosecutor seat, prosecutor again. January of this year, he was charged with voyeurism. Um, he, he, <laughs> apparently, this woman is sitting there in the tanning booth and she's lying down and she sees this ad come over the top of the wall and there's a, a cell phone and he's recording her and she starts screaming. Um, and of course, this is just the kind of thing a lawyer wants to do. No way that you're walking into a place that has cameras, security cameras. You had to sign in. He signed his name. I mean, <laughs> here I am, and I intend to shoot photos of women tanning. You know, it's just crazy. Remember that don't be stupid thing? <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know the outcome of this case. Not forget, but don't, don't ever forget video. That'll come up again, too. Uh, 
Uh, this one here in January of this, this year. Uh, again, we have another prosecutor where the PowerPoint, and, and I just can't believe that the, um, the gentleman that was uh, being <clears throat> charged here for the prosecutor's uh, murder conviction was over, it was ended up over, being overturned. That because of all of these types of things, I mean, the, the defamatory things that he put up there in, a, in his closing argument and his PowerPoint. So he had 250 slides out of a PowerPoint for closing argument. I don't, does that take about like three days or something to go through that? I don't know, but that's a boatload of slides. But 100 of those slides had headlines on it that talked about the guy, defendant Walker, guilty of premeditated murder. <coughs> <laughs> and the words guilty were over the, oh yeah, you know, flashing right up. Yeah, they flashed, guilty, like, guilty, guilty. You know, like, give me, give me a break, dude. Um, <laughs> then, he had one slide where there was a picture of him uh, eating uh, dinner with his family in the Red Lobster. And the prosecutor's allegation was that, well, he's spending all this money because he robbed these guys. So he got this money, and now he's flirting it off and, and, and buying dinners and doing, doing all <coughs> that stuff. Um, all stuff that had not been introduced yes. in the closing argument. Yeah, it's, it's cra crazy stuff. All right, now this guy does not look like the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> he just doesn't. I don't know if you have the same visceral reaction that I did. But he has, he resigned this year from the bar. He, he, he pleads. Did you have his picture? Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I mean, it's, she even took his picture. Look, she just it. Yeah, that's hysterical. <laughs> I'm not going to ask why. <laughs> so he, he pled that contest to the misdemeanor charges of marijuana and obscene material distribution. Um, he got two one-year suspended sentences. He said, again, gentlemen, something you never want to do. Do not send photos of your stuff to clients. I mean, that's junk. Just, junk, yes. <laughs> yeah, the boys call, our boys call him junk. So he, then he texted her. He wanted a threesome with her daughter, and the daughter was 13 years old. Yeah, so the police took over the phone again. Does this have a slight echo? You've heard this before. They took over the phone as the mother, and the mother, which is the police officer, asked if he would drop the legal fee if they complied. <coughs> he said, of course. So <coughs> things people do. Now that's a lawyer. <laughs> that is a What's lawyer wrong with Winston Salem. Well, you know, that's a very good question, John. I, 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 I sent this I sent this to Jim McCauley. And I said, Jim, <laughs> he's he's near naked, he's all oiled up, spritzed up. I said, I said, you know, you got did a this, problem. Did this get through the bars filter? Well, <laughs> this is in our state. Oh, okay. This is Winston Salem. This is not our state. But I said, would he have a problem in Virginia? And, and Jim just shook his head sadly, and he said, no, um, we, we don't discipline for tacky. Um, <laughs> so that's what he said about that one. That was like the car with the advertisement. That's, right, that's right. He said the same thing about yeah, car advertisements. This is Corey Fetman. She's a Chicago matrimonial lawyer. Her website calls her incredibly talented and beautiful. And she was briefly employed by Playboy as the love lawyer columnist. I love that name. Um, she had a huge billboard that said, life short, get a divorce. Well, some very <laughs> stuff we saw. That. Yeah, yeah, I know we did. <laughs> we, 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 it did stop you. I mean, it, it did stop you. You had to look and read the time. That was before Ashley Madison, too. Yes, it was. It was before <laughs> Ashley Madison. Yeah, we do, we do a whole thing on the dark web and Ashley Madison and all that. Um, anyhow, uh, this was taken down by a very zealous alderman who was deeply offended by it. So Corey, not to be outdone by any city alderman, she, she now put this on trucks all around the city and buses all around the city. So to this day, you will go to Chicago and potentially see her, her trucks and signs and all this stuff, so it's still there. Um, now, she also has on her website a gallery. She has some interesting, that word is in quote, photos. Um, if you want to check it out, do so, but don't check it out at work. Um, I, I don't know. Use your neighbor's computer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, this This is apparently okay uh, by the authorities in, in Chicago and Illinois. And it reminded me very much of Elliot Ness in The Untouchables when he says, well, you're not from Chicago. <laughs> and I guess not. I, I think this one might have gone over the top for Virginia. And, and, and that didn't this one for <laughs> Raposa has been up against the disciplinary folks in Texas for years now. In 2014, he put out this video, um, and what he's doing, 
uh, which is a little hard to see here, but there's a woman in the back, she's got massage oil, she keeps stuffing it on him, and he keeps rubbing himself while he's talking to the disciplinary folks. In fact, well, you can see the drop cloth, you don't want to get on the bed spray. And, uh, he's very, <laughs> apparently, he's very thoughtful. Um, I don't know where he is, maybe that's his office, who knows, it was a hotel, which is probably more likely, but anyhow. So, this video goes on for some time. This is another one I wouldn't suggest watching at work. Um, it's creepy, it's downright creepy. But he's on the phone with the bar folks, which made it really interesting to the bar folks, <laughs> who did not know, of course, that all this was being recorded. Um, he, he's just, he's had many encounters with them. And his most recent one was March of this year, when he made a profanity lace video, and you can see what he said there. But he printed up all these buttons, uh, the, not buttons, um, what do you call it, stickers, that said exclusively for white people. And he posted them on stores that he thought catered to white people and not to other people. So he was constantly going around putting these stickers up and they were constantly having to take them down. He looks a little skinnier there. It's not a terribly clear photo. Uh, he lost some weight anyway out of the whole mess. But this, this made the papers again. The disciplinary people were called again. I, I don't know why they can't do anything with him, but uh, he, he, he is just a character. Well, he calls himself, he calls himself bulletproof. Um, and says he has balls of steel. Uh, I think he has Brock's in head, but that's okay. Uh, he, he was 90 days in jail once. Um, he, I'm not going to make the gesture at the place where he made it, but he was facing potentially both the judge and the prosecutor and made this motion in court, and he was sent to jail for 90 days. So he has a long, interesting history. More things you never want to do. Okay, this is from July of this year. A suit was filed against Knox Rickson and four of its attorneys. They allegedly conspired, this is a completely different case now, to hire hackers to hack into law firms with workers' comp cases. Uh, we've already established, you all agree, they can't do this. <laughs> um, the, the reason they got caught is because they showed up in court and they had the intake file for the client on the other side. And they apparently showed it. And the judge went, wait a minute, where did you get this from? And if, if you guys may be too young to know, <laughs> to know Jack and Lisa, they started going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, looking at each other. They couldn't come up with how they'd gotten that file. They had no idea, that's what they told the court, they had no idea how they got that file. But then there was some investigation done. Don't know yet what's gonna happen again. This is one that's been filed, all of these are allegations. But when you show up with the other side's client intake file in court, you can't explain how you got it. You have an ethics problem, at least potentially. So, this guy, um, and we're back in Illinois now. I didn't do it, but so what? 
So that's kind of where, where that one is. The latest thing they heard on this particular group of, of, of attorneys and how they're, they're going after folks is one, one lawyer who's involved in a case with said, said, you know, it was a great idea. They're claiming he downloaded this stuff and they wanted to, they wanted to do an examination of his computer. Well, he's got a friend that's from the Middle East and he came out really, really good friend. He came out and visited him. Well, he was looking for a little kid. Yeah, and he, he stayed you know, several weeks with him and he loves this kind of stuff. It's because they're pornographic films. So he says, it must have been him downloading it because it wasn't me. <laughs> he's such a good friend that I gave him the laptop to take back. <laughs> So they dropped they, the case. Dropped I thought, the thought it was a little too expensive to send yeah, somebody they in. They dropped yeah. the case. That was the most ingenious thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Bore no relation to reality, but it worked. Well, we don't know. We don't know if it was well, reality. We don't know for sure. Yeah, I'm pretty bad. sure the lawyer who was telling it didn't think it was a real story. We have October of last year a suit against a New York law firm for sending unsolicited text messages. And this happened right after the Fannie Mae multi-billion dollar settlement. So he basically sent a, a text messages, unsolicited text messages to folks saying, hey, Fannie Mae just settled this thing. Why don't you call me and I'll let you know how that's going to impact your mortgage. So what ended up happening there is he got disciplined. The viol it's a violation of the Telephone Consumers Protection Act that was, was actually modified in 2013. So I guess if he would have called on a cell phone, you know, those robocalls, he probably would have got away with it. But since he texted, this Telephone Consumer Protection Act was actually changed in 2013 that you, you're not allowed to send an unsolicited text unless you have um, opt-in, if you will, or, or approval of the recipient that you can send them text messages to do that. Okay, there's, we teach an entire class in our CLE on ethics and e-discovery, but this, this, this is one of the best cases from August of 2014 when Judge Mark Bennett, who you see here, uh, he got a little pissed in this case, and he said, something is rotten, but contrary to Marcellus's suggestion to Horatio, it's not in Denmark, whether it's in the discovery in modern civil, civil, federal civil litigation right here in the United States. He, he called what had been done uh, by one of the parties, discovery, mired, and obstructionism. So the obstruction of justice really bothered him, and Jones Day was the firm that was ordered to make a video. He was worried about attorneys who were grandstanding for their clients, um, obstructing the flow of clearly discoverable information, a war of attrition, intimidation and harassment of the opposing counsel, and of course the whole thing had become very costly in a continuing battle. So he said that they had to write and produce a training video uh, in which they had to explain the rationale of the judge's opinion, uh, which would be a most interesting video to see, but he did not, he did not order that it be made public. He ordered that it be filed under seal with the court for review and approval. I do not know whether they ever made that video, uh, but I would sure give a lot of money to see it. So July of last year, I'm gonna tell two pieces here. This is an attorney that did the reply all. Now you guys aren't doing that, right? We don't do the reply all all the time. Yeah. So look who's in that, <laughs> that address that's there. Um, a school superintendent had stage four breast cancer and uh, was alleged to have uh, basically correcting students' test scores. And so they had this, this action that, that came out um, and effectively she had a note from the doctor that the doctor had said that she was too ill to participate in the upcoming trial, which was happening I think the next day or so. Um, so then this attorney here, the assistant district attorney, decided to do a reply all and said, surprise, surprise. Well, that didn't go over real well. And I think what, what made it even funnier is, you guys ever see those message recall things? So-and-so wants to recall their message. You know, no, no, you were stupid to send it to begin with. And now you've just accentuated your stupidity by trying to get it back. Now everybody's going to go and look at it. <laughs> we have a friend in Fairfax, a divorce attorney, who did this on a listserv. She was asked about um, an arbitrator, and she uh, she answered uh, the entire listserv with uh, that woman is a witch, but not a, it, it was a bee, <laughs> was the letter. And, and so, of course, she immediately went to recall it, and now everybody went back and looked at the message very carefully uh, because they know that something was going on. So that was a very embarrassing day for that lady. 
Now, certainly the attorney was very frustrated about a delay, but is it really an ethical violation to do that? I mean, it probably was not real smart to do that, to, to send that, that note out there. But she did end up getting suspended for three days. That whole, this whole email piece, right, this reply all, that stuff, there's another case where a New York lawyer, as part of a settlement agreement, sent uh, an email message talking about the settlement, what her client was willing to accept in settlement, but sent it to uh, a reporter instead of the colleague. And not that's, that's an autocomplete thing. She started typing it. And oh, not, not any <laughs> reporter, a reporter with the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. yeah, it was a very bad day for her, too. But that kind of thing happens pretty often. Have you guys been watching the trial of Dewey and LaBeouf? I gather most of you have not. Um, three lawyers are charged up in New York with cooking the books. Um, their indictment has 106 counts in it, which is some kind of record. The big charges were grand larceny, <coughs> falsifying business records, security fraud conspiracy. And they I, I've read many of the emails, and they talk very openly about fake income, accounting tricks, and their ability to fool the firm's clueless auditor, and let's, let's reclass the disbursements. Um, so seven non-lawyers have already pled guilty, and the firm shut down in May of 2012. It was the largest law firm failure in history. Um, so that was, that was where it started. And then in 2015, the trial began. Uh, what the prosecution showed was, and, and of course this case has not been decided yet, they boosted revenues by 10%, and they boosted the, the amount of their assets by 1,000% in what they were telling their banks, et cetera. In, in one example, they spent $125, $125 million long-term loan that was meant for capital improvement. They gave most of the money to the partners. So in an email, he said, yeah, we, we spent most of it to pay the partners. Obviously, I couldn't tell the bankers, so I told them that we used the money to do capital improvements and technology upgrades. So flat out lying, they faced uh, 8 to 25 years in prison should they be convicted. The, the uh, charming gentlemen are here, as you see. Um, and this is what the public thinks of lawyers, which pisses me off. Anybody involved with the disciplinary system ever gets pissed off when people who have done this sort of thing you know, end up like this. The amazing thing about that is, remember you saw the screen before that we expected the trial to last uh, six months? Well, it didn't happen that way because on August 28th, the prosecution rested and the defense didn't put on any defense. Now, that's an interesting choice. Um, so they simply moved to dismiss the charges because they said that they couldn't render a guilty verdict as a matter of law because they had presented sufficient evidence. Uh, the judge denied that. The case actually, you've got to pay attention to this because it's going to be an interesting decision. The case went to the jury last Wednesday. As of this morning, no decision had been rendered by the jury. Uh, I know, of course, what always happens is I'll walk out of here and the jury verdict will have been granted. But that's, a, that's just how this goes when you're a presenter. Um, uh, they, they, they did, the defense did argue that it was all fantasy. That's what they said. The jury has been asking for more and more emails, and they asked the judge to read um, what the charge was for falsifying business records. And, and the part I thought was hysterical is at the bottom of the note to read this, it said, Please read it super slowly. <laughs> and super was underscored a bunch of times. So obviously they needed a little bit more help there. Um, and then I'm going to use this as a jumping point to tell you that if you have not yet seen The Judge, you need to see that movie. Good movie. Yeah. Uh, how many of you have seen The Judge? Good movie, huh? Robert Downey can act. Who knew? <laughs> I mean, he's not just a Iron Man. I have seen them all. I'm very <laughs> few. I've seen every Iron Man. Um, and, and I, you know, those are okay, but this is a really good movie. Downey can act, and there are so many ethical quandaries presented in this movie. It's really good for that. And, and one of the quotes that I really like about that, that I kind of thought about when I was reading about the jury, um, this is actually Downey talking. He says, did you know 90% of the country believes in ghosts? Less than a third in evolution? 35% can correctly identify Homer Simpson's fictional town in which he resides. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the lucky 35%, John. Less than 1% know the name Thurgood Marshall. But when you put 12 Americans together in a jury and you ask for justice, something just south of brilliance happens. Um, I think most people who are involved in litigation will tell you that there's a lot of truth to that. Um, uh, I have reached, obviously, my own conclusion in this case, and I hope the jury reaches the same one, but we will see. You never know. 
April of last year, Virginia successfully uh, prosecuted a <coughs> patent attorney who had no previous criminal law experience, but yet they filed an amicus brief in a death penalty case in Arizona. Um, <coughs> the, the funny part here is he had some pre hearing motions. He wanted the court to set a particular temperature for the courtroom, and he also wanted to have leave to eat M&Ms at his counsel table. Pretty gutsy, man, right? Yes, yeah, he asked for this in, in writing. <laughs> it's really pretty amazing. So this is, another, you know, sex is a big problem for male attorneys in particular, sometimes females, more, more often males. Um, <laughs> Ross Day was uh, sued by a young associate. Uh, he's a pretty famous attorney uh, in Oregon, apparently. He created a phony email address. Of course, here we go back again. People who do digital forensics can prove this. And he sent graphic emails to this young lady. They reference Fifty Shades of Grey. They reference the fact that he had a fantasy about having an affair in the workplace. He sent her a link to a video about a girlfriend activation system. And you can imagine what activation means. Um, so you know, I, you have to wonder at the end of the day what Mrs. Day thought when all this came out. But he told her when they were traveling together, he would leave his hotel room door unlocked so she could come ask questions any time of night. I mean, it just, it boggles the mind. It just boggles the mind. So I don't know how that suit came out. So February of last year, the New York Law Journal uh, had an article where basically they said that it is unethical for you as a lawyer to be using outdated, unsupported software. Because the reason being, it's not getting those security updates. Therefore, your client's data is at risk. Microsoft XP is out of support now, yet we still see some lawyers that are using XP because it 20, 20, works. 22% of offices still use. Office 2003 and even Server 2003. So even the solo small firms that are running Server 2003, that is out of support. So <clears throat> their opinion was that it's going to violate Rule 1.1 and 1.6. And remember, this would apply to any legal software that's no longer supported. And they will continue to work, so lawyers continue to use them because they don't want to pay the upgrade price. They don't want to switch to another thing. They know this thing, it still works. They don't get the fact that there's no security updates, and that's a, that's a tunnel into their network, potentially, if the vulnerabilities are exploited. This is one of my favorite ones, so I kept this because it's from 2013. But look down there. You see that red circle? This is, this is a uh, law firm that does DWI work. And look up here, this is a Florida site called Mugshots. There's one of the lawyers who got busted for DWI. So he managed to get his face on the page twice. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just thought that was great. And you can imagine some clients probably thought, well, he's been where I've been. So maybe this is a good deal. Who knows? I think this is an excellent example of targeted marketing. <laughs> that's, that's what we thought. That's what we thought. So this was actually a real story that we got involved with. Now, we changed all the names here. But what happened was, in the case of the essential facts, I can tell you, we had a very smooth talking lawyer who took money from a nursing home resident. She had a very good malpractice uh, med mal claim. And the statute of limitations expired in 2005. A retired pro bono lawyer went to the nursing home. He, you know, he helped out with some of the, the residents. He heard her story about how this lawyer had taken all this money and done nothing. So he filed a complaint with the bar disciplinary folks. The bar required a response by January 31 of 2006. Now again, this is all fake. Peter Quinn does not exist. Um, but this is one of the few times I actually fabricated it. No, he fabricates it for education. <laughs> he, the first thing he did was Mel Gibson invited me to dinner. Back when Mel Gibson wasn't a jerk. Was you, you had uh, Mel Gibson at legalweapon.com. Do you remember that? Yes, I did. That's, a, that's like a lot of years ago. Um, I bounced it off a Korean server. Yes, so that it, it was not easily traceable. Um, it's interesting to be married to John. You never know what's happening. I keep telling you, if you look at my email, you're going to ruin all your birthday surprises, so stay out of my email. Um, but I have, no, I have no illusions that he can't get into it if he wants to. So he, he came with this letter, and it's dated before the statute of limitations ran out. And it basically says, I, I know that you don't want to proceed with your case against Dr. White, even though it's meritorious, and it's, you feel it would have a great impact on your health. I understand your concerns. In light of our conversation, I will take no further action on this case and will close my file. Now, at this point, he's, yeah, he's blown. She has blown $4,000. 
$40,000 for nothing, effectively, because he never did file with them. So, so we get the electronic version of this uh, office computer, and if you notice here, this uh, document was created two days before it was going to appear before the disciplinary Not on August 1st, not before the statute of limitations had expired, but two days before his disciplinary hearing. It did not go well for him. It went very poorly <laughs> for him, and he didn't like digital forensics people after that. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, this is Aaron Brockler, an Ohio prosecutor. Uh, I don't know why he thought it was a good idea to do what he did. He wanted to get alibi witnesses in a murder case to say that they were not with the, the killer, and he actually succeeded in this. So he created a phony Facebook account, remember that admonition against deceit, and he chatted with them. Now the next day he admitted his identity, but having done this deceitful thing, I mean, he was, he was fired, and I was pretty proud of the, the prosecutor's office because they basically said he had disgraced himself and disgraced the office. So their boss did exactly what a good boss should do in this, this kind of an ethical situation, but not, not a smart move. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we have two Minnesota prosecutors that are <laughs> reprimanded. This is August of last year. These are comments that were posted on Facebook. So he's in a jury trial, and he posts up there, wake up, people. I'm spending my week with 12 idiots. <laughs> Obviously not a good idea up there either. And you look at this, this picture, and you can see why someone <laughs> might pose that. But, but you can't post it. You just can't do it. All right, this is one of my favorite stories, too. This is Florida prosecutor Ken Lewis, and this is from May of 2014. Uh, he, he posted on Facebook, happy mother days and all the crack hoes out there. It's never too late to turn it around, tie your tubes, clean up your life, and make difference to someone out there that deserves a better mother. Charming, absolutely charming. Um, so he all in there. Um, there was a, a photo of, of Sonia Sotomayor, <coughs> Mr. Sotomayor, and the Facebook page read, reason enough why no country should ever engage in the practice of affirmative action again. This could be the result. Where would she be if she didn't hit the quota lottery? Here's a hint. Would you like to supersize that, sir? So he, he actually, considering what he wrote, I think he got off pretty easily. He got reassigned and he got sensitivity training. Um, yeah. think, I don't think sensitivity training was going to help this in, but that's all right. That's all right. You know, we got to watch what we all have to watch what we put um, on on social media, and it's never nothing good, as my friend Jennifer Ellis says. Nothing good ever came of a 2 a.m. tweet. That is true, and nothing good ever comes of drinking and posting on social media um, or using some other substance posting on social media. Um, that is a time to take your hands from the keyboard, especially for a lawyer who cannot afford these kind of issues. Um, what, one of the cases we had, the most famous case in Virginia, was probably, this is the one that I think everybody loves nationally about this, and I, I wish we didn't make the news in this kind of way. Um, but this was a case in which it was a wrongful death suit, and a cement truck had tipped over, and it killed um, it killed this, the wife of the plaintiff. His attorney was Matthew Murray, and he told the plaintiff to clean up his Facebook page. Can you do that when you've got a wrongful death suit going? No, you cannot. And he did that because this gentleman, this photo is actually was uh, staged by a newspaper, so this is not the actual plaintiff in the case, but he had an I heart hot moms, and he had various other inappropriate things on his Facebook page. So the photos were deleted. They were later recovered forensically. Um, Mr. Murray hid the relevant email telling him to clean up his Facebook page, blamed his paralegal. So we are getting error compounded on error here. Ultimately, he got a five-year suspension. He got an enormous fine in the court case. Um, and he ultimately left the practice of law. In many ways, a very sad story. But just because you've got bad stuff going on, I mean, he would have been so much better not to blame his paralegal and to own up to it and to get forensics involved himself to try to recover those, those photos. They would have gone much easier on him had he acknowledged making an error. Um, so this is a, just, if you make an error, do your best to reclaim 
reclaim your name, reclaim your integrity if you make an error. This is an old one back from uh, December of 2010. Two Florida attorneys, they got into a peeing match with each other. It's never a good idea to send emails and document your stupidity, right? Because this is what they had in there. Junior, jerk, asinine, old hack. Uh, and they went after their wives and their children. These two attorneys in this verbal battle going back and forth, right? One was ended up uh, suspended in order to take anger management. The other got a public reprimand, reprimand and told to take professionalism classes. So, you know, take the high road. If some, somebody wants to be the jerk on the other side, and just don't play the same game. Uh, <clears throat> this is one out of uh, Virginia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, We've seen James, James Roper, several yeah, we've seen it several times. Brian Denny, Denny we won a case against Denny. Uh, and Denny was accused of swindling clients, but the other attorney, though, ended up getting a three-year suspension because of his the way he acted in a deposition. So these are two charming gentlemen, right? They don't get along at all. Uh, Denny was in 2012 was indicted in 25 counts of fraud. He ended up pled guilty and he faced up to 50 years in prison back then. These are some of the things of. Uh, that were in with the emails that he said. Uh, <clears throat> he hoped he would enjoy 20 to 30 years in prison. He was going to comfort his wife while he was in prison. Uh, he, that's the way he signed it, laughing still, Jason Roper. And he made some kind of a, the sexual victimization, as I recall. He, yeah. he said, enjoy soap on a rope. Something um, like that, yeah. So um, this letter panel found uh, the kind of reflected on fitness to practice law. He got a public rep reprimand. You know, as well there. So again, anger management classes. Uh, I don't know if it did them any good, but I don't either. Um, digital detractors is a big problem these days. Um, so we had in January 2014 a, an attorney who was reprimanded for violating Rule 1.6, and that's because she was responding on AVO. Um, she was responding to a client posting, "She only wants your money." And then she wrote, I feel badly for him, but his own actions in beating up a female co-worker <laughs> are what cause the consequences he is so upset about. Um, you obviously cannot do this. How many of you belong to Avo? How many have claimed your profiles? A few, okay, a few. Um, how many of you have your firms um, been reviewed on Yelp? Yeah, okay. How many of you know what Avo is? Oh, I think they know what it is. It's hard to avoid Avo. In fact, if you watch television, the commercials are just going to be there. Um, and now that they got, what was it, 70 odd million dollars, um, now they, they're really jumping their campaigns. Um, so, you know, we have seen, and I kid you not, we have seen attorneys get on posing as an unhappy client of a competitor. So they're trying to diss the other guys so that they have lower Yelp rankings by posting phony reviews. Um, and we have seen lawyers posting as a happy client of himself or herself. You can't do that either. I mean, all both of these are obviously involve deceit and make you unfit for the conduct of law and everything else. So you know, one of the things that we learned recently, we got a, a bad review on Yelp. It really, somebody in, a, in the service area that we're in, you don't generally get reviews on Yelp. But this one guy posted this terrible review, and he was an IT client, and we had we had given a proposal to him, and in, instead of having us buy the equipment, he decided he knew what he needed. So he went out and bought all different equipment. Well, it didn't work together. It did not work together. There was no way anybody could make it work together. So, you know, they left as a client, understandably, and then they posted this absolutely scurrilous thing on Yelp. It was just awful. And so it really it's upset not even accurate. Oh, it was nothing. It was nothing accurate. I mean, he said he spoke to the president of the company. That's me. He never spoke to me. So there's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff. So what I did was I went around to our clients and I had, I asked our clients, told them what had happened, and asked if they could submit positive reviews. And we buried him. He was gone in 24 hours. So that's a much better solution than trying to respond. Um, yeah, you know, does have a system in place that tracks the IP address of where those yeah. reviews come from. Yes. And if all these positive reviews for a business come in from the same IP address, they block it. And they even, they even throw it up on the screen with a, with a notice to the visitor saying, we've had a lot of the same IP address doing positive results here, so 
Bear that in mind as you're you're looking at the ratings for the business here. <laughs> yeah, Yelp, is, Yelp itself has gotten much more aggressive. Remember, we talked about videos, and I told you there would be another video story. So we had a 72-year-old attorney who was suspended for 30 days after being videotaped with, in prison with a client. What had happened was she had come and, and she had complained to the prison authorities about him groping her and so forth. Um, and so, you know. She's a prisoner, they don't necessarily believe her, but finally what they decide to do is to put, put the two of them in a room with a camera, with a microphone, and they have a meeting, just an attorney-client meeting. And within that meeting, he did some touching, he gave her a hug, he probably could have gotten away with all that, but that's not where he stopped. He took her hand at the end and put it down his pants and he said, wouldn't you like to say goodbye to your little friend? So that didn't go over real well with the ethics folks either. So <laughs> that was 30 days. So remember those cameras. It, it's just a mess. <coughs> West Virginia got in the news as well. So this story is, we got hus husband and wife are two lawyers. They work at different law firms. They happen to be, uh, have a case where they were co-defendants on a case, but they had different desires. In, so opposing in interests. Yeah, opposing interests in that. But husband thought wife was having an affair. So husband says, well, I need to check her email out. So it was very easy for this law firm, because they post the email addresses of all the attorneys. And if you ever use Outlook Web Access, OWA, right, that's how you get it. You, you pump that in there. And then all you need is the password. Well, the password that the law firm set up was the uh, last name of the attorney. Not a very secure password system. So once he figured that out, he's watching his wife's emails, and after a couple weeks, he's feeling ticked off because she's not having an affair. He's, well, he's like, bored. Yeah, he's bored. So he decides that, you know what, since I know the scheme of this law firm, let me see what else I can see. So he starts jumping around various partners at that law firm <coughs> on the same case. So he starts getting all this information about the, their strategy in the case uh, and then uh, how it relates to him. Well, West Virginia didn't like that. They ended up suspending him for two years. Uh, as, as we say up there, the, the victim law firm, the, the wife's law firm, was probably guilty of not protecting the client data because they should have. That's a pretty weak system to have in place. Especially uh, today. Especially today. The other piece of this puzzle is that after this two-year suspension, he ended up being hired by another law firm. I, I, I think they were looking for his particular <laughs> skill, <laughs> skill set. <laughs> uh, we, all, we all know William Shatner. Yes. <laughs> Again, that rule 701 is deceptive. Make sure you have those disclaimers that are on there, right? Um, not an attorney spokesman, spokesman or whatever, you know, all those different things that you'll see out there. So make sure that you, uh, and I heard Christy talk about that, right? The advertising things that the Virginia State Bar has, so make sure you check it all. I think they're going to rewrite much of that. One of the things that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a retired president of the Virginia State Bar, um, but I told Ed Wiener, who's the current president, that the portrait of me that he has painted is not of a retired president because he has me chairing three different things, one of which is the future of law committee. And one of the things I think that committee has decided is that our marketing rules perhaps are sadly outmoded um, and have become that you know, very quickly by things like social media and, and things like Avo and, and Yelp, et cetera. And so we're thinking that one of the things we need to do is take a good hard look at some of that. And I hope that some of you who are young lawyers will participate in that because we need people who are very active in those things uh, to help us understand how they're being used. So one of the other things you need to be aware of are, are lawyer scams, and lawyers, in fact, are being targeted. This is our good friend Dan Pennington. He's at uh, he's one of the vice presidents at a uh, uh, practice carrier up in Toronto. Walker. Yeah, Walker. And, and, and he also is an expert on lawyer scams. That's one of the major things. It, 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 se it seems like Canada gets the scams before they come to the U.S., at least over the years that's happened. Um, so what Dan does is if, he, if there's some new twist on a scam, he'll shoot us an email. So we kind of get a heads up and a warning as to what it is. But be leery. This usually happens like on a Friday or something where somebody's in a big hurry. They're going to give you a certified check. They need you to you know, issue funds right away. So you're, they're running it through their trust accounts and all this other kind of stuff that's there. So just because money is available 
doesn't mean, or if it's a certified check, doesn't mean that it really is. The bank still has a right many, many days later to rescind those funds. And if you've distributed them, you're pretty much stuck in screwed. Yeah, and what, what um, I find a lot of lawyers think is that if they go on their online accounts now, you, you'll see the money. That doesn't mean they can't take it back. But they think that because they can see the money, they're in the clear to write the checks. Not so. So be wary, primarily if they're in a big hurry, right? If they're in a big hurry to, to run this transaction through. So be suspicious of that kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> this firm in uh, D.C. was on the hook for $350,000 as a result of it. We had a client as well that, um, and these things can become very, very sophisticated when they're targeting somebody. So maybe it has to deal with a, 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 an action, a lawsuit, a case, because a lot of the stuff is public knowledge, right? You can go get the court pleadings, you know who the attorneys of record are, <coughs> make email messages look like they come from somebody else. You can set these links up and do all this other, other jazz. Uh, one in our particular case, one of our clients, someone, uh, he got an email message that appeared to come from uh, the president of the company saying to wire transfer $25,000 by tomorrow afternoon or this afternoon or whatever it was to this account number. Uh, the guy didn't, the uh, chief financial officer, it didn't ring a bell right away because in the domain name, two of the letters were switched. So he, he, uh, thought, he thought that, you know, just on a quick look that it was real. So he and he even used the president's nickname, nickname. Not, right. not his given name, but his nickname, which, so somebody had researched that. So he ends up transferring the funds, realizes that, oh, crud, no, they would never make a request like that. It was about two and a half, three hours later is when he finally realizes it. Notifies the bank, well, when you do a, um, and apparently they do a lot of these transfers as well, and uh, international transfers, funds transfers, that you only have two hours to rescind it. And he was outside of that window. So I went, they asked us to do some investigation. We went and did some research and things on that. That domain name that they put up there that they used, they went to Amazon Web Services and they created DNS entries there. That thing was only there for three days. So it looked like it was valid, the sites and all this stuff. Domain was valid to get these email addresses, emails back and forth, and then they tore it right down. So technology today has actually really made it a lot more difficult for you folks to recognize those scams, and especially a lot of the virtual services that we have now. I mean, it's so easy to bring up it, to use Amazon or any of those kinds of things to, to build these fake and then rip them right back down again. And phishing is the other thing that in any law firm, at least 11% of people will click on attachments or links within emails that download malware. So training is really important, but there is an ethical duty to know something about the technology so that you know to, to, to look at something to see if potentially this, this is problematic. And one of the things they, they have done is they have used what looks like the domain name of law firms or courts. Um, so just because it appears to come from a law firm or a court doesn't mean it does. But so what some firms have done even to help combat that is if there's any financial transactions that need to occur where, and maybe they've got a system set up where financial transactions only come from this one partner uh, and this one person processes them. They work some sort of code word so that the request <laughs> has to have that one, that unique word within it that only those two guys know. And if the email message comes from somebody else purporting to be from let's say that partner and it does not contain that word, well now they're already suspicious. And they change that on a, uh, on a periodic basis. And a lot of times what we'll, we'll get, um, uh, and, and sometimes you do this internally in a larger firm, um, you'll, you'll send it to somebody, you'll have somebody like us in the law, a law firm, and they will install it on a machine that's not connected to anything. And then they'll watch the install and see what happens. Um, so you can actually check for malware that way too. That's beyond anything you all could do, but be aware that there's people that you can ask, certainly in Venable there would be. So we had a, a gentleman by the name of Bob Cohn who's, who submitted a comic book brief. He's pretty ingenious, actually. It is. He was, he was very upset uh, when there was an antitrust suit uh, that the Justice Department brought against Apple and other e-book uh, providers who they said were fixing prices. And the Justice Department made a settlement agreement with it. He wanted to file an amicus brief, and the judge said, fine, file it. You got five pages. He said, I can't do it in five pages. 
but he abided by the rules of the court. He had the correct one inch margins. He had 12 inch font, and he did this comic book brief. Um, now, I was, I, I just thought it was interesting that the court accepted the brief. I mean, there were no ethical complaints, nothing like that. They just took in the comic book brief. So, uh, yeah, I guess it didn't really matter to the court. It wasn't submitted by the attorneys for the principals, but interesting. Read the terms and conditions of any of these services that you guys are using. And I'm not going to embarrass anybody by saying, who's read the terms of service for Dropbox? Who's read Facebook's terms of service? Now, you'll read them for your clients, because you get paid to do that, but you won't read it for yourself. So understand what you're agreeing to in those terms of service. They're written by smart lawyers and great business folks. And most of the time in those terms of service, you actually are giving someone access to your data. And you have <clears throat> accepted those terms, and you've accepted that what they're going to do with your data, and potentially your client's data. So that's why you know, I know it's, it's crazy. Uh, I think the last time I, I looked at uh, Apple's terms of service out of iTunes, it's 27, 28 pages long. And they change. Facebook changes its terms of service all the darn time. And, and it's never to the benefit of the user. But I, but I know it's always that click, 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 I accept, I accept, I accept, right? There, there was several studies. Uh, there was a, um, a gaming company out in the UK that put the terms of service out there. And when you, when, you ex when you clicked accept, what it did was you actually agreed to give your soul to them. <laughs> and so they collected, I don't know how many, thousands, thousands of these things. They ultimately sent notices to those people saying that they were relinquishing that term and they could have their souls back. <laughs> there was another one that... I, I like the Judge Dixon. And Judge Dixon yeah, told me this one. He says... Promise the first war. That was another one. But the one <laughs> Judge Dixon out of D.C. Superior Court, which I love, he said he saw one where, you know, you have to scroll down to the bottom in order to light up the accept button on some of these things, some of the terms of service. So there was one where the guy... You, just, you scroll all the way down and you click accept and a message box will pop and says, damn you read fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, re remember the insurance company. We don't cover stupid. They're going to tell you that if you didn't read the terms of service, that's... Well, Ashley Madison, that's a good point, right? All these guys that are upset about Ashley Madison say, you know, they, they released our data and, all, and the, the fembots, that there's less than, what, 5% or 3% or whatever that real, are real, real people. Most that, of the that, women on Ashley Madison are fembots. They're actually so they have, they, have, they have this class action lawsuit now about this misrepresentation that this this was all these were all fake these people, and then the attorneys for Ashley Madison turned right around and they threw the terms of service back to the to the folks and says, really, did you read what you accepted? It says that this is for entertainment only and we make no guarantees as to the authenticity of any identities. You agreed. <laughs> An excellent resource for you. This is. And it, it, I know it's from the ABA. <laughs> it is free. Uh, is LTRC, Legal T uh, Technology Resource Center. You don't have to be an ABA member to access this. But as you see here, we have Cloud's Ethics Opinions. There's a lot of really good information that's that's there, that's on the L LTRC site. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, vendor uh, uh, reviews and things, and product reviews, and those kinds of things. I know a lot, we tell a lot of our solo attorneys when they're first starting, Use this resource. Go there. You're going to find a lot of the information that's going to help you in your practice. Back to the terms and conditions. Uh, <clears throat> Spotify and CNN, in August, they changed it. Uh, Spotify changed their terms of service to the point where there was massive revolt. Big time. So within about a week, they changed it again. There was less of a revolt. <laughs> so there's a lot of pressure on folks, and apparently some folks have been reading these things. You know, as, as Sharon said, Facebook is notorious for, for changing. And as one, one small example of this, do you know that you have agreed that as long as you keep Facebook open, um, which is what most people do, they go up to Facebook several times a day, as long as you have it open, they can track wherever you go on the internet. And there are allegations of whether or not you have sent to that Facebook's doing it anyway. Unproven as yet. Um, so you're agreeing to potentially a lot of things that they track you where you're going, have access to certain information. But Facebook, you face, Facebook knows where you are every time you connect to Facebook. So they have every geographic location, longitude and latitude, every time you connect. Assuming you have GPS. Assuming you have GPS enabled, which most people do. But a lot, but a lot of the, uh, the apps, especially on your smartphone apps, 
right? The certain permissions that you're giving that app to, to gain right. access to. Um, Geolocation is one of them. And the point here is that from, from marketing perspectives, you are the asset. They're selling your data and making money off of what you do. Um, so it's where are you at? Uh, what what are you doing? And it's more than just that. They're, they're, um, some of these uh, products, and this scares a lot of folks, we do a whole session on geolocation, but they use a process called crowdsourcing. So it's not just you. They're also looking at other folks around you. Now we can draw a, a relationship as to uh, using geolocation. I know how you go to work every day. Therefore, I can make an assumption as to here's where you live, here's where you're going. Now, every Tuesday night, you play poker, so you go somewhere else. Well, geez, I see all these other guys coming there as well. And through crowdsourcing, through gathering that data from other other sources, they're able to draw a lot of uh, inferences. And that's, that's all big data analysis. And it could be used to stock women. That's a very common thing that people are doing in some of the apps where geolocation is, is enabled. So the ethics of encryption is really changing. We are starting to reach an ethical consensus uh, that mobile devices must have whole di disk encryption, um, that you need to encrypt email where appropriate, because now email encryption is very cheap and very easy. $10 a month per seat. Um, Texas or, 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 less. or less, if you get volume, high volume. Te Texas issued an ethics opinion in April of this year, um, and they talked about their factors of, the sensitivity of the data. Um, do you think the NSA or law enforcement might be watching you? Are you using a public or bar computer? Are you sending it to a shared account? Are you sending it to a client's work account? I'm going to talk more about that uh, in just a minute. Um, anyway, there, there are, there's a whole list of factors. But I'm starting to see emphasis across the country say, you need to encrypt where appropriate. It's too cheap and too easy. You know what you have to do now? You have to push a button. And the button says, <laughs> encrypt and send. You don't need to understand encryption. I don't understand encryption, and I wrote the book. Um, it's math. It's very hard math. I, well, I wrote the book. With two, I, I, wrote, I wrote the book with two geniuses, so that I was covered. Um, I wrote the parts that were math. Um, <laughs> but it, but you just push that button. That's all you have to do, and your email is encrypted. Very easy. Well, a lot of the problem with, with with attorneys in particular about dealing with email encryption is they remember the old days of PGP encryption and using PGP to encrypt email. And you can still do that today, semantic purchase PGP. But it's difficult, it's complicated to set it up. And you have to exchange keys. Before, before you could send something, you had to give your public key to the other person, and then you had to keep your private key safe. And then they had to give your, their public keys back to you. And then you had to register those keys into your software. It was a pain in the butt. Today's modern email encryption schemes do not require <laughs> key exchange. The services take care of all that stuff. So that's, it's, it's the old style mentality that attorneys are remembering the hell that they went through before, that they don't want to try the new things. <laughs> and they need to, they absolutely need to. I think you're gonna see more of those opinions. Uh, this is one good reason why we need to adopt encryption, especially on mobile devices. This, this happened this year uh, to this law firm. Uh, and. It, it, it was reported to the California Attorney General that one of their lawyers had had a laptop stolen on the NTS trolley in San Diego. And we know that it was unencrypted. Why? Because they wouldn't have had to report it if it had been encrypted. If it had been encrypted, it would have been safe. But it was not encrypted, so they had to make the report. And this, too, is something that insurers are excluding from coverage. So if you don't encrypt your mobile devices, you're not covered when they're stolen. So you have no data breach coverage. So your smartphone, make sure that you have a pin on it or a lock code. Uh, I don't recommend the, the swipe patterns if you're using an Android because you, your, your fingers leave oil on the screen. And in about 80% of the time, you're able to guess what that swipe pattern is. And there's statistical analysis that shows that once you see that swipe pattern, people don't use a lot of the nodes that are available. There's nine total nodes that are available on Android swipe. So they, they use like letters, they use like an L, you know, they do an N, is that what you <laughs> <laughs> But that's the kinds of things they do, they do like an O, you know, all the way around the outside. So statistically, it's easy to guess what, what those things are. Now I don't know why all you guys are here at a CLE and why you're not standing in line to get the new iPhone success, <laughs> but the, uh, the, I'm probably out of them, uh, of the Tyson's. 
but change that default password that you have on your on your phone. If you're an iPhone user, the default up until iOS 9 was four characters, four digits. Your software made that will crack four digit iPhone passwords in less than 15 minutes. The new iOS 9, now the new iPhone 6 and 6S and, and 6S Plus, are gonna change that to now require a minimum of six characters. I think you should have eight, and not just pins, but combination of pin and letter, so a passphrase kind of, kind of thing. Um, that's to protect the contents of that phone. Your smartphones are really nothing more than computers that make phone calls. So, and they hold a tremendous amount of data that's, that's on there. So you need to protect that. You've got your contact information, your emails that you're retrieving. Even though you didn't save data to your phone, a lot of times that data is there and it's saved. Particularly with iPhones. Yes. iPhones. By a factor of 200. If not more. iPhones are, are uh, evidence rich, extremely evidence rich. You need to make sure that you're able to destroy or wipe those phones as well if you do lose it. Uh, I had a friend of mine tell me that there's really, you know, forget Blackberry, Android, iPhones. There's really only two kinds of cell phones. There's the one you lost and the one you're going to lose. So. Make sure that they're protected and that you have some way in which to remotely kill that data or at least make sure that it's encrypted so that if somebody puts in too many darn uh, invalid attempts that it does wipe that data and makes it inaccessible to someone. And Apple, to be fair, is, is getting very, very good at the encryption is, is extremely strong, uh, especially in iOS 9, uh, to the point where the government is all ticked off about it as well. Uh, and Android is going to begin doing the same thing that Apple is doing that's required in, by default to have encryption enabled. So Texas talked about not emailing your clients at work, but most of you do. I, we know this from studies that most, most lawyers do. Most employers have a there's no privacy on our network policy. And of course for security reasons, there really can't be. They really have to be able to get to everything. So ABA formal opinion, uh, which was adopted in 2011, says you, know, you can't do it at work. Now, I have, we have seen the attorney-client privilege broken on multiple occasions here in Virginia. So we tell people, what's the, they always want to know, well, what's the solution? The solution is you write to your client at a personal email address, and they pick it up on their own device using their own network, whether it's a Wi-Fi, a, a 3G, 4G phone, whatever. But they don't use a work device, and they don't use the work network. That breaks the privilege. So even if it's their smartphone and you're connected to the employer's wireless right. cloud, can't do it. Can't do it. They have a right to monitor that. Can't do it. So that, that's the answer to that. I got a lot of grief when I told that to. Uh, who was I talking to? I don't think I did. Well, they didn't like it. They didn't like the answer. <laughs> um, so, family, family lawyers, I think. <laughs> so yeah, family lawyers definitely don't like that. Um, addressing email, I think, in your retainer helps you uh, to be ethical because you express stuff to your client. You've told them that email isn't always private, that there's not guaranteed delivery. You get the client to agree to consent to its use. Um, the retainer should, their engagement letter should say uh, that the client should not transmit sensitive data by email, which they all tend to do. Tell them not to email through work. Make them initial that paragraph. Um, set a response time for your own emails because they, they want you available. They, yeah, they want you available 3 a.m. in the morning, and that's just not reasonable. Um, but I know in large firms, I've had arguments with attorneys who said, if I don't answer my client at 3 o'clock in the morning, he'll find a lawyer that will. Um, so there is that philosophy. I don't need that client, but apparently in a lot of large firms, that is the mentality. I don't see how you keep work life, life balance with that. But that's another issue. And finally, make sure you whitelist court domains so that they don't get trapped in your spam filter. This happened to a firm in Colorado who felt about like this after the court assessed <laughs> sanctions, including payment for opposing counsel's time, and the court suggested it was malpractice not to whitelist the email address of a court. Um, now, to the question, whitelist one attorney or the whole firm, I've talked to Jim McCauley, Ball Bar Counsel, about this, and he says, you know, there's no way that you can know who's going to write you. I mean, it's not just one attorney. So he says for the duration of the, the trial or the, the matter, you should whitelist the firm. But of course, that doesn't mean that you're not going to get some kind of phishing email. You might. So 
but that's his best advice. So that I can't do better than Jim McCauley. Um, and there I have made it on time. Are there questions I can answer for anybody or John? Uh, defamation case recently where uh, it was about things that were sent on Facebook. Yes. So the order was that we should remove them on Facebook, but parallel obviously requirement to not destroy the evidence. Uh, and in the case, didn't really know what to do. Eventually, came up with an agreement with the other side attorney that we accepted that in fact. Well, you know, with, did with, happen in fact, and this with, with Facebook, you, you can deactivate because it doesn't destroy any of the data. Right. So you you can do that, and and that's what most people will choose to do. Yeah. So deactivate, make them. Yeah, yeah it makes it makes it so it's not visible. But but yeah, on the other so hand, but it's still the there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can respond to discovery, and it's four o'clock, and I don't know about yeah. you guys, but I want to go get a libation somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you all have a great weekend. <laughs>